everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, on behalf of the Rustin Museum, I'd like to introduce you to our guide for this evening's journey through time, Delegate Ken Plum. So when we took the troubled waters and we go back to the 1960s, I don't know how much you remember, but there were troubling times as well as some promising times. We remember uh, looking at this montage or collage here, John Kennedy. You know, I was in Washington, D.C. when John Kennedy was inaugurated. That morning of the inauguration, I put on all the clothes I owned. Because you may remember, it snowed a couple of feet deep the night before. And there were flamethrowers on Pennsylvania Avenue to get the flames cleared off of Kennedy could make his way down. But also, too, during the 60s, we had the Vietnam War. That caught a lot of people's attention, had us rethink a whole lot about our foreign policy. The Beatles showed up. That was a big fancy time. And a man walked from the moon. We also had, of course, the hope that was promised to us with the uh, speeches of Martin Luther King. That starts us off in the 60s. Voting rights act was passed. We don't think we should have kept that in place. Robert Kennedy was also assassinated. Troubled orders. Richard Nixon was like president. Troubled orders. <laughs> <laughs> but we ended up too as the first man on the moon. Uh, this little girl was reading the headlines when he was talking about two men walked to, to on the moon. But in western Fairfax County, during that same time period, when all those things were happening, some other things were happening we ought to remember for a bit. If you were here before uh, 1960 or so, you may remember, of course, Robert Simon hadn't bought the uh, Sunset Hills farm at that point in time, that there was a distillery uh, that made Virginia Gentleman bourbon. And in 1961, the largest farm in Virginia more than 3,000 acres. It was sold to a New York developer. And you know his name. Robert well, E. Simon. That's what it looks like today. You go down Old Ruston Avenue, that's a historic trail. It runs past the little building on the left, which was a train station. And the WOD trail had a train on it back in those days. And if you look at the right, that's how the distillery looked. There's a story right across from Plaza America Shopping Center. And uh, the DeLon Bowman family that owned all that property, they had the largest farm in Virginia. After Prohibition, they realized that they could make more money, money on selling uh, bourbon than they could on raising corn. So they raised corn and turned it into bourbon. <laughs> you were here early in that period of time when the story was still in way, still working. You'd see a truck leave a couple times a day 
from the uh, farm, dairy farm, loaded with a green mash stuff. It was steaming. It was the mash that came out of the distillery, and they took it out and fed it to the cows. That's also part of the part of the distillery. But down at the lower left corner, you can see part of the railroad track. Should we have kept this order load or should we have taken it down and made it the trail? <laughs> People say we had the most contented cows uh, in the area. That was Preston in the early 60s. There's Virginia Jones. They still are in business, so that they moved down to Spotsylvania County, uh, down in Fredericksburg. They're still, uh, still making Virginia Jones. Fairfax County Bourbon didn't make out so well. Let me say also too, this home is in the back of Bowman property. It's a, it's a, it's a cooperative uh, condominium property off of uh, Reston Avenue, across from Spectrum. That's still there, and I'm not totally sure what it's used for now, but at one time, when uh, Bob Simon was here, a lot of his professional staff worked out of that building, and once they then got a place of their own, it was turned into a Virginia Tech graduate center. So we had graduate classes there. And now I think it's still probably this co-op uh, office. I want to point this one out to you. This, this photo was taken in 1986. Wow. And take a look at the train heading down the track. That's, that's Sunset Hills. Uh, train station and the road crossing in there is Old Reston Parkway. But news then hit the scene about what was happening in Western Fairfax. It seems that a developer from New York who had gained some money from an inheritance when he sold Carnegie Hall and he decided to use that money to build a, a utopian community. It made headlines. Town in Virginia to rise for 75,000. That's a newspaper headline in the Times. But I pointed out to you because how many people do you hear you say, oh, wrestling's not what it was meant to be? It wasn't intended wrestling to be this uh, highly developed. We haven't gotten 75,000 yet. So, in fact, part of the Simon vision was how you could use land in a way that people could have access to, to the amenities of the land, to each other and so on, living together. So the notion that, that this was somehow a way to get rid of density is not really the true case. Made, he made headlines. New York Times covered the decision because that's a big land deal. How is it that Simon picked out rest in, excuse me, a, a farm in Virginia to buy? And the answer is the biggest hunk of land he could find on the East Coast. He was looking for about several thousand acres, and that's what he found in one sale. He could get that much land, so that was very attractive for him coming here. So we're going to look at Rustin on the world stage in the 70s. That little part about the 60s was simply to set the stage for what it looked like then as we turned the, turned the corner into the 70s. about Ruston was that as it was envisioned, it would not have been possible to put it in place in Virginia, put it in, place in Virginia at that time. Because land use didn't allow it. The land use methodology at that time was to cut up a piece of land into blocks, half acre, one acre, several acres, and sell those off. And a hump of these you'd call them a residential, and some places you'd call them commercial. But what Simon envisioned was a place where you could live, work, and play all integrated within a plan. But Virginia law did not allow that kind of zoning. So Robert Simon hired a uh, former mayor of the city of Fairfax, Ed Pritchard. Because at that time in Virginia, you either were a county, you were a town, or you were a city. And what we needed was some way in which to blend the best of those together with a new vision of what the community would look like. 
And so he chose Ed Pritchard, a land use lawyer, a man who worked in local government as mayor of Fairfax City, and they went off to the legislature, and believe it or not, they were able to sell the idea. Simon assured them he wasn't going to have any more people concentrated in the area than you do in the current zoning, but he would simply use the amenities against each other to create a, a, a planned community. So Reston was the first to use PUDS, planned unit development, planned residential community development, whatever term you want to use, and now drive around the landscape and look at people who work like Ashburn. Where's the town of Ashburn? It's, it's not a town. It's a planned unit development community. And you go all over the state now where there's any uh, suburban development and you'll find that that methodology of the value of land is in place and in use. It's proven over the time to be very advantageous. So the bridge over troubled water is taking into account that land use was not working well in Virginia and we need to do something about it. So you could come up then with a master plan, master plan you periodically review, master plan if you don't like some part of it you call your supervisor, tell them how it could change, but over time you uh, you have a concept of what the community ought to look like. The, in the, past, the, past, the pattern in the past was for somebody to start building some houses. And you know, Mr. Wheelie did. Dr. Wheelie, over at the, uh, you know, the window Wheelie uh, mansion is, the white brick uh, facility across from town center. Dr. Wheelie had drawn up a plan that was essentially a checkerboard plan, selling off the units to start a house, starting housing. The problem was Dr. Wheelie died before we got started. So it never got beyond him building a big house for himself and just a couple houses still there in the Township. But under this plan, you're talking now about an integration of a community, a way in which you can have a community part complementary to each other and supported by each other. So in Ruston, 1963, construction begins on Lake Ann. 64, first residents move in. And in 65, let the center here opens. In 1966, there was a dedication of Reston. You know, Lyndon Johnson was here, Governor of Virginia, Mills Godwin was here. It drew a lot of national attention, international attention, as a matter of And <laughs> I think it's 1972, I think, I we got our first time. <laughs> that's a sign of advancement, right? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, you can find lots of these references in the Ruston Museum. Go over and ask them to use some of the, look at some of the Ruston times of years gone by and you'll find some interesting things. But truly, what else happened? You all remember that sign? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't miss it, couldn't miss it. The only problem is it's so darn far out. And I remember the first time walking out Route 7 looking for it. In fact, it went for miles and miles and miles. What do they expect to do out here? And of course, that was a problem. It was so far out in the country. And you make a supersized sign to make sure people know where that turnoff is. <laughs> but I think what's more symbolic about this sign is you turn left. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what the community, in fact, represented turning left. Here's the notion put together by an unnamed artist back in the early days. A community that's open to ideas and to make the work. Open to people in all their diversity. Open to nature and its very spaciousness and variety. Open to planning as the best way to come to create community, privacy, recreation, and culture. It's open to hope. We salute the developer for building the first moderate income housing in Reston and continue to search for more effective ways to economically integrate our community. We need to all be proud of that. That is a tremendous statement. And what was happening in Virginia at the time, we'll take a look at too. Virginia was a segregated community. And we're talking about segregated community up into the 60s. 
for some communities it's the 70s. And the segregation occurred not only in housing and redlining where people could buy and live and so on, but it occurred in the schools. It said in the Constitution of Virginia, Negro <coughs> children and white children not go to the same school. It said in the Constitution. That's how important it was to people at the time. So the idea of coming along, of saying you're going to have an integrated community where people of all diversity, background, culture, whatever, are going to not only be able to live here, but if you're interracially uh, married, you can live here. Because you see, it was the case in Virginia, it's just the law for people of different races to get married. But there was a couple down in Caroline County, just around Fredericksburg, who fell in love and they got married. And he was against the law. So they moved to the District of Columbia for some years. They lived in the District of Columbia where they were legal. But they, there hadn't been any enforcement of the law for some time, and so they came back home to Caroline County. And about two o'clock in the morning, there was a banging at the door as the local sheriff who arrested them because they broke the law. That's loving versus Virginia. Dick, uh, excuse me. Bernie Cohen, a member, uh, friend of mine in the House of Delegates, carried that case as the first case he ever argued before the Supreme Court, and the Virginia law was overturned. Loving v. Virginia. Bernie tells the story of how he was talking, and Richard Loving, an ordinary guy, he's not have to change the world, he's not a well-educated whatever guy, he sent a guy, and when Bernie said to me, now you don't have to go along to this appeal, but what would you like me to tell the court? And he said, would you tell him I love my wife? Pretty, pretty, pretty good argument, when you say. <laughs> and there were times like this all around in Virginia that segregated people. And then this guy from New York shows up and openly and directly talks about allowing people of different cultures and backgrounds and races and so on live together. Pretty far out idea for Virginia. That's why I thought it was so interesting he had Mills Godwin come and speak at the uh, dedication. Mills Godwin is the governor who uh, was elected as a Democrat, served as a more like a Dixiecrat for a term, um, a tiny bit more progressive than the bird machine generally, but not a whole lot. Served his term, the community college system got underway and so on. Then, in the next election cycle, the Democrats who were changing then in their attitude and so on, decided to, to nominate for the candidacy for governor Henry Howe. After knowing him by history and politics back in those days, they referred to him as uh, screaming or howling, howling Henry Howe. Because he would make these impassioned speeches like, we're going to keep the big boys honest. And the big boys, he was talking about them with that though. But we're going to get people and allow people to take part in the government. We'll get rid of these discriminatory laws. And he said, I'm going to pass around this buck here. Now, if you help willing to help me out, you put a little money in there. Because he was funded by the people. He killed scared the receivers out of the bird machine. This guy, this crazy man, could get elected. And so when he tried to figure out who is could beat Hal, because Hal was really popular with the working class and so on, they decided that Mills Godwin, who had been so popular, let's run him again. Now, you can't run twice consecutively in Virginia, but you can run and be elected, be out of term, and run again. So Mills Godwin was the only governor of Virginia to ever serve for two terms. One term he was a Democrat, and the other, the other term he got honest and called himself a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I had a picture. Laverne Gill, you all know Laverne Gill. She passed away not too long ago. She has a series of books about uh, resting black citizens. And it's worth your while to take a look at. Her husband still lives in the area. She did a lot of research on local black people in, in the rest of the community. In 1970, Diana Ross and the Supremes performed their last concert together. The Beatles, in 1970, released the Let It Be. I was going to use that as my theme song for the night. But <laughs> rich, but, uh, we don't want to let it be. We're, we're going to talk about change. But they also broke up. But back in Reston, there was developing among the people of Reston a spirit of community. 
But on some of that mind where they actually cause people to come together and so on. Now, what you know, might know if you come to one of these lectures where they talk about his history and the development of Reston, you know by this time he's out. Golf Reston has said to him, in effect, all these amenities that you're putting in, swimming pools and trails and all the sewer work and so on you have to do to get this community together, it's burdening us with lots of debt, burdening you with lots of debt. We've got to find something that people will buy. It's true that these townhouses, so when you're building around a lake, they don't really step forward in terms of architecture, but people don't seem to want to buy them. So up until 70, the community wasn't really doing very well as it relates to being an economic success. And so Simon was forced out, and we'll pick up the story in, in another decade when he actually comes back to Reston. But by this time, it's a matter of golf Reston in many ways. What was so neat about Reston Interface was that the community planning took into account that we have to be concerned about people's spiritual self as well. And so here, the churches in the Reston area got together to form a Nonprofit, they could raise money, gather food, uh, work on housing issues, and so on. And it became rest in their faith, made up primarily by a dozen or so church organizations. Now, you know, as history goes along, they expanded upon the concept, and they have more businesses involved, and they do much more, and they do great things. Uh, rest in their faith became cornerstone. people to come together or encourage people to come together. And from that they get build a sense of community. 1971, open fellowship house at Lake Ann. Or it's torn down, does a new one. <laughs> and it just make you feel old. <laughs> and again, have some sense of where we are in history. This is when the first microprocessor was released by Intel. That was a while ago. Nixon again. <laughs> Those ramps to the Dulles Access Room were actually put in by the developer. Uh, as a politician working in this area, I can tell you every election I promised I was going to open the Dulles Toll Road to commute traffic. <laughs> and none of us ever succeeded. The developer, though, got a good idea. He put some ramps in that you could run some buses onto and use, use it for buses. And so the, develop, the, the, the bus system developed by the community. One of its selling features was you could get into the city in a hurry because the ramps were open to allow you to get on the Dulles Access Road. It's on, yeah, it's on the Access Road. As the history goes along, eventually there's approval for, for a bond issue to build the parallel lanes, which were paid for by the tolls. Caught a lot of flack back in the time about why we build a toll road. And the answer was simple. We get the road about 25, 30 years ahead of time. Build it ourselves and charge some toll. And after all, back in those good old days, 